Thank you all. Thank you for attending today's RDA webinar on the citation. Of, uh, let me present you our speaker. Um, Andreas Rauber is Associate Professor at the Department of Software Technology and Interactive Systems at the Vienna University of Technology. He furthermore is President of AARIT, the Austrian Association for Research in IT and a key researcher at Secure Business Austria. He received his master and PhD in computer science from Vienna University of Technology in 1997 and 2000. Andy, please go ahead. Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on from where you're joining in. And yeah, thanks for participating in this, this webinar. What I'll was planning to do for this webinar is to run very quickly through the challenges that we addressed within our working group and then spend most of the time first of all explaining in detail the recommendations that we elaborated and then also go into a bit more detail on some of the pilots and adoption use cases that we've had so far and the ones that are currently being worked on by different groups before moving into a, a summary. If you've got any questions, I'll try to keep an eye on the chat screen. So let me know if there's anything that I should address while talking. Otherwise, we'll also move into a discussion session at the end of the presentation. Good. Next slide. So what, we, what we're trying to address was finding a way to allow people to, or to make it easy to enable them to cite data. And that seems actually at first glance pretty easy because you know, people are doing it. You put a URL in the footnote, you put a reference somewhere in the bibliography section. Some people even have managed to get the DUI arc or some other persistent identifier for that data set that's stored in some repository. So the question is actually, what is the problem that we are, we are trying to address? Why is it still an issue? Why do we, do we need a working group to deal with it? And the key things that we were addressing was two aspects. One is the granularity of data. <clears throat> Something we see is that the databases that we're dealing with, that repositories are collecting enormous amounts of data over time. Data keeps being added. You've got a, a huge data set. And researchers very frequently don't use the entire data set for an analysis, for a study, but use certain subsets of it. So they select whatever, certain rows, certain columns, certain attributes, time spans from the entire data set. And the question is, how can we easily and precisely identify the very subset that was used in a study? Um, approaches that you currently find is that people describe it in the method section of the paper, providing a natural language description of basically the subset that they were selecting from the database, which is usually not very precise. It's kind of ambiguous. So imagine if you only describe, you know, I took the center measurement data from the 15th of January until the 25th of April. You, does that include or exclude the 25th of April? Um, you may specify that you removed outliers, but not be very precise in the cutoff boundaries of those. So. It's a kind of clumsy way of describing it, which is good for human readers, but it's not very precise. And a user who then wanted to get exactly the same data set would have to recreate exactly the same subset based on the description, hoping that they end up with the same number of data items that, that you had in your study. Another approach that you find is that people download the subset of data and put it as a separate set somewhere, so have a copy of it, which doesn't scale terribly well if you're writing whatever, another four, five, six, or 10 page paper and say, here's my another terabyte of data that goes with that one. And it's also kind of a data management issue to have multiple copies um, all of the time. We've also seen people proposing approaches where you assign an, an identifier to each individual record and then you provide a long list of records that were being used in a study. Again, that doesn't scale terribly well. So one of the things we wanted to address was we wanted to find a mechanism that allows you to very precisely identify and cite the very subset that was used in a study. 
the second aspect that we were dealing with, let's hope for this light to update. Yep. The other aspect that we're dealing with is the dynamics of data. Um, in the old days, we had static data sets. So a data set was created, dumped somewhere and it stayed that way. But what we have in most cases today is that the data is dynamic, meaning that new data keeps being added to a data set. Um, when we discover quality errors with the data, we correct errors, we delete erroneous values, we update er uh, measurements that were wrong. And that happens in irregular intervals, sometimes highly dynamic, so data coming in in the microseconds. In other cases, you update an error, find an error every now and then, and manually correct it at irregular intervals. However, if we ever want to repeat an earlier study, or if somebody wants to verify an early experiment, or if you want to compare your method to an earlier published method, you want to make sure that you feed exactly the same version of data in as was used in the original study. So what we need to find is a mechanism that allows us to identify and cite data exactly as it existed at a certain point in time. And ways to do this is was either providing an accessed at date which doesn't help much unless you can go back to the version that was that existed at that timestamp, or people would um, do artificial versioning, so do annual releases of the data. Any change that happened in between, any download that happened in between would be either delayed to make, to make those updates available, or it would not be retrievable anymore. So those are kind of the, the two key problems that we were addressing within um, the working group, dealing and supporting dynamic data that allows corrections, additions, deletions, and being able to identify arbitrary subsets of data. And that arbitrary subset can be the entire database. It can be a row, a column, a set of items. It can even be an empty set. So even the fact that no data existed satisfying certain criteria should be citable. We wanted a solution, or we wanted to have principles that work independent of the technology. So we didn't want to have one solution that would work only for whatever comma separate value files, another one for SQL databases, another one for XML. So we wanted to have principles that are stable, also because technology will change. Data will be migrated to new data representation. We wanted to make sure that the principles hold. And we wanted to have a solution that is of course, useful for the humans to, to read and identify the data set, but it's also machine actionable, so that doesn't require manual parsing and understanding of natural language descriptions in order to identify the data. <clears throat> and we wanted to make sure that the solution is scalable, so both for very large, for very highly dynamic data sets with very frequent updates, as well as for small data sets, static data sets, <clears throat> all the way down to spreadsheet files or comma separated value files. So it should really be a set of principles that one can apply no matter what the data looks like. <clears throat> and this was the goal of the working group which was established in March 2014 and it officially ended and released the recommendations in September last year at the RDA plenary in Paris. And one of the key issues that that we decided right from the studies that we wanted to focus really on those two problems. We wanted to have a solution that was independent of the persistent identifier systems that you want to use, and we did not discuss whether you know, DOIs, ARCs, URIs, or whichever other identifier system you prefer. We didn't really go into detail on what additional metadata is required to describe a data set for citation purposes. We only discussed metadata that we needed for the identification of the subsets, and I'll show you examples of that later on. We did not really also discuss in detail how to phrase the citation string, because you know, what to put in the reference section as a textual description, and how to calculate attribution and contribution of um, data owners, creators, curators, and so on. Um, how that attribution share should be distributed. <coughs> 
because there is other groups working on, on those issues and we decided to collaborate with them. But what we wanted to do is to enable people to really identify the subset so that you can actually cite it. And this was basically the working group that Ari Dieter, um, myself founded with Stefan helping us um, as a secretary for the working group. And what we have is an output, and that's the things we're going to present to you in a second. Sorry, the slides move faster than I intended to. It's two core output documents. The first thing that we came up with was these 14 recommendations that I will run you through in a minute, um, which we have presented on a two-page flyer that's linked from the working group website. And we have very recently published a bit longer technical report that goes into a bit more detail explaining, providing a bit of background in, um, information on the various recommendations, examples, how they can be implemented for different types of data. So those were the two, two documents that we uh, created for in, within the working group. And we are still working on finalizing, polishing some of the reference implementations and are now moving increasingly into pilot that implement those recommendations in different data centers. And I'll show you some examples of this as well during this webinar. Now, let's take a look at the, the recommendations. And I'll first start with the principles of, of how they work. So conceptually, what we have is whenever we want to identify data or make it citable, we have the data stored in some form of database. And when I use the term database, I mean it in the most generic way of the term. So it can be a SQL, a SQL database, MySQL, Oracle database. It can be a comma separated value file. It can be a spreadsheet. It can be an XML database. It could be linked open data. So it can be a file repository that has some index structure on it via file names and other metadata. So any kind of data. And we have means to access the data. So we have some form of query language. This can again be a proper query language like SQL. Um, it can be Sparkle queries for linked data. It can be row and column cuts and grabs via shell scripts or some Java program that allows you to um, identify subsets of the data. And once we have those data and these ways of accessing and selecting from the data, there's two things that we have as underlying, as a key concept, our recommendations. The first thing is, in order to be able to go back to earlier versions of data, if we want to enable users to go back to data as it existed before certain updates, we need to make sure that the data is versioned. Um, meaning that any change that happens, any deletion, isn't really a deletion of a data set, but it, it is marking that data item as deleted. Um, if you correct the value, uh, you don't overwrite the original value, but you mark the old value as deleted, and you reinsert the new corrected value. This way you can always go back to an earlier version. And in order to know when that has happened, we need to make sure that all those activities are timestamped. So whenever something, a new item is added to the database, a new entry, we need to timestamp um, the point in time when that data item became available. Whenever something is deleted, we mark it as deleted and with a timestamp when it was deleted. This is kind of a history version or versioning of the database. That way we can go back to earlier states of the data. Now for identifying the subsets, we do not assign persistent identifiers to the database, to rows, to columns, or to individual numbers. But remember that we have a query that describes the subset of data being selected. So the principle that we recommend is to assign a persistent identifier to the query, where the query again has a timestamp when it was executed. I'll go into more details about this timestamp a bit later. But basically we have this persistent identifier pointing to the query with a timestamp. And if you then want to go back to the original data, you simply re-execute the timestamped query against the timestamped data source, retrieving again the same subset of data. So this is the core principle. Timestamped and versioned data, 
and a query store where you store the timestamped queries. And there's a little bit of magic for query rewriting and hashing of the result set as fixity information that I'll again talk about in a bit more detail once we go into the individual recommendations. Now, how does this work in deployment before we take a look at the individual recommendations? For the researcher, the whole process should be entirely transparent. So the researcher usually will not be aware of the fact that there is a query being stored in the background. For the researcher, it's, they have a workbench with which they access the database. Um, can be a web interface, can be an API, JSON interface, whatever. And in that interface, the researcher selects the subset that he or she wants to use. Sets filter criteria, select the subset. Can be a regional query on a map, drawing a boundary. Can be uh, faceted browsing, filtering criteria whatsoever. When they finally have the subset that they want to use, when they kind of click on whatever, a download button or um, a button that then sends the data, the selected data into an analysis process, uh, we assign a persistent identifier such as a DOI, URI, ARC, to that query and store it. We then compute some hash value over the data as fixed information to be able to check later on if the query, when the query is re-executed, that it's really the same data that was selected. And we provide the researcher with a citation text snippet just to encourage them to basically copy that in a bib tag, endnote, or whatever format and put it into their, their paper. Now, one thing I would like to, to highlight here is, is two or actually three advantages. First of all, the persistent identifier that the user gets as part of the recommended citation text leads to a landing page. And that landing page, at least, uh, that landing page can provide you know, detailed metadata on who created that subset, what is the parent, subset, uh, what is the parent data set that this, is, this subset was selected from, uh, who, who is the curator of the overall database and so on. But something I think that's important to stress is that this um, detailed metadata includes the query. Whether the query is made explicit or not depends on the user setting. But in any case, the query string provides excellent provenance information on the subset of data because it's a technical description on the select criteria on the boundaries on the filter settings that identify the subset. So it's a much more precise description than any verbal description that a user would add uh, to describe the data set could potentially be. So we have for free, basically, fully automatically, an excellent provenance and subset description of the data set. The other thing is, I said you could rerun the timestamped query against the timestamped database and get the original subset of data again. This is nice, but this is something you could do with a redundant dump of data as well. What the current approach also allows you to do is to run the same query against the current timestamp of the database. And this allows you to get the semantically identical subset of data, but including and benefiting from all corrections, additions, and so on that have happened to the data since. So you can not only retrieve the old data, but also the new view on exactly the same data. And once you have those two, you can also take a look at the changes that have happened. So you can also identify which studies were potentially affected by a certain update in the database. And if you do a reverse lookup, potentially notify researchers saying your data has changed that might affect your result, do you want to rerun them? So that's two additional benefits that I find pretty neat and useful that come in inverted commas for free with the chosen approach. When the user then activates such a persistent identifier to get to the landing page, there the query gets re-executed and the results of the original data are returned. Another benefit of the current approach is the last one, which is the, the query store that stores the queries. This allows the data center also to understand and have a documentation of which parts of the data are actually used. So you have basically um, an entire history of the, the usage of data 
as part of the query store, which is another neat side benefit of the, the chosen approach. Now, as I said, um, those recommendations, um, we summarized them in 14 kind of very rather detailed technical recommendations grouped into four phases. Preparing the data and the query store, um, actions that you should set when you want to identify a specific subset of data, and then actions that are needed to resolve a persistent identifier, and what happens if we modify the infrastructure. And we had a first detailed discussion of the recommendations at the end of March. We then ran a number of workshops, um, seminars, did a few pilots, went through a few conceptual evaluations with different data centers uh, before finalizing the recommendations and coming up with those, with that two-page flyer that basically compresses them. Now here is the, the 14 recommendations on, on a single slide. So the first block, the yellow one, is preparing the data in the query store. Recommendations one, two, and three. The next set of recommendations all deal with specific activities that you may want to consider in order to precisely identify your subset and get stable persistent identifiers assigned to them. Um, 11 and 12 is for resolving the persistent identifier and 13 and 14 are forward-looking recommendations. What happens if you change the technology of your database, if you migrate the data to a different representation? How do you deal with that? And what I'll do now is I will go through those recommendations one by one, briefly explain what the idea behind the recommendation is and give you examples of how they could be put into practice. Um, the first three recommendations I discussed pretty much in, in detail already. So recommendation one is data versioning. Make sure if your data is undergoing updates, if there is values being deleted, if there is values being overwritten, make sure that the data is versioned so that you can go back to an earlier version if you want to support that. If your data never gets deleted, if there is only additions to it, well, then this versioning doesn't happen. Basically, there is no overriding. Um, if your data is dynamic, so whenever there is new data being added or data being deleted, make sure that any operation on the data is marked with a timestamp when that change became visible. So when that change happened visibly to the user so that you can make sure that when you then later on select or re-execute a query, you only consider those data items that were visible at that point in time. And the third recommendation is also pretty trivial. Provide some means of storing the queries and some metadata for the query store. Again, something that was interesting when we went through a few of the early conceptual pilots was that data curators every now and then were a bit worried that time stamping and versioning would be very expensive in a sense, so that keeping earlier versions of data would kind of be too much of a strain on the data center. Um, surprisingly, we found in quite a lot of situations when talking to the IT people that were running the database that in many cases, this timestamping and, and versioning was already part uh, of the data infrastructure anyway. It was happening in order to be able to roll back the database, in order to safeguard against um, either unauthorized changes or in, to safeguard against errors that might happen during the data processing. So those timestamped and versioned databases were actually already present in a surprising number of um, pilots that we were discussing. And it, is, it has been standard technology for quite a long time, and it's all even part of the new SQL standard, SQL 2011, that um, has this time concept as part even of the SQL query language defined already. And another concern that was issued initially was that the query store might grow very large. And we, we went through a few examples, and we found that unless you had really queries by the microseconds that all would need to be persisted, um, the query store would grow extremely slow. So unless you're running a search engine like whatever, Google or Yahoo, Bing, whatever, um, with queries in the microseconds, then uh, the query store would not grow drastically in size compared to the data. 
So this was surprisingly little concern when we went through example. Although, of course, extremes exist if you have, you know, updates on the data in microseconds and frequent uh, corrections, additions, and deletions. Now, for the second part, once you have done your timestamping and versioning of the data and you've prepared a query store, what happens when a user selects data? Whenever a user wants data, a subset, to be persisted, and only in that case, so it's not for all queries, but for those queries where a user wants to make sure that they can go back to it and cite it again. That's when the next few recommendations come into play. And we also had a use case where users would be um, selecting subsets of data. The queries would be stored in a temporary storage unit and would automatically be purged after two weeks. Unless a user within the two week period, time period said, okay, now this is the data set that I want to keep working with. So it's not that every query needs to be stored. It's only those queries that should be persisted. Now, when queries should be persisted, we want to make sure that we assign a persistent identifier only to unique queries. So if three people issue the same query at the same time, returning the same data set, then we want to make sure that they only receive one persistent identifier, not to have different identifiers for basically the same, semantically, same set of data. So what we need to do is to identify some way to identify that the query is unique. So what we usually have is some way of rewriting the query to a normalized form so that if the same query was phrased in different ways, um, we can identify that it's the same query via some checksum over the query string. This is impossible in the very generic case because there's so many different ways how one could phrase a query that it's virtually impossible to, to really identify or guarantee uniqueness or identity. However, in most cases, researchers select subsets of data not by manually writing SQL queries or Java code to select subsets, but they use some kind of API and some kind of uh, workbench interface. So in most cases, recommendation four is already in place because the queries are generated in a standardized way by the workbench interface. So in most cases, this is taken care of. Recommendation five uh, ensures that the data that is returned from the system is always sorted in the same way. This might not be an issue in, in some use cases and others it is. So basically what happens is that a data, most databases are set phased. So if you issue a query, they return the same set of data items, but not necessarily in the same order, especially when a database is distributed or when it's using different optimized indexes uh, for optimizing query processing, they usually do not guarantee that the data comes exactly in the same order. And what we need to do is, in those cases where the processing order of the data, so the sequence in which the tuples are returned, has an important impact on the subsequent processing, then we need to make sure that the query first applies um, a standard sorting of the returned data before applying any user-defined sort. Can, this was not a critical issue in many of the pilots that we've gone through, but in some cases where machine learning processes were following afterwards and where users wanted to guarantee identical results, uh, we needed to consider this stable sorting. Recommendation six um, is a rather trivial one where we said once you have the result set, let's compute the checksum, some kind of hash key as fixity information over the result set so that when, and store that as part of the metadata to the query so that later on when we re-execute the query and we retrieve the data set again, we can verify whether we really got an identical data set. Just to be on the safe side, to be able to detect if somebody, if there were some changes to the database that bypassed the versioning or if something went wrong in the uh, query re-execution. Just a sanity check, basically. Recommendation seven um, seemed pretty trivial when we first discussed it because it basically says assign a timestamp to the query when the query basically was executed. What we came about across in several of the pilots when we were conceptually discussing the effect of the various recommendations 
we found out that there was different timestamps that one could assign. And the most trivial solution, namely the timestamp of the execution of the query, would potentially reveal information that the researcher would not like to be revealed, such as when did you issue that query? Was it in the middle of the night? Was it during the day? And so on and so forth. So we were considering what other timestamps could one consider that would not reveal the precise time when the query was posed. And the recommendation that we currently make is saying that you should uh, assign the timestamp of the last update to the entire database because that also most closely um, resembles the concept of versioning, of the traditional versioning saying each update basically would consider a version, would be considered a version of the database. So again, it doesn't make any difference semantically. The recommendations work whichever timestamp you assign, either the execution timestamp or the timestamp of the last update to the database or even the timestamp of the last update to the subset of data that's affected by your query, which is a bit more complex to compute. All three of them work identically. The recommendation says, you know, the last global update is the safest, so to speak. Um, if we go further, once we identify, we have the query, once we have the data set, we need to, identify, uh, to assign a persistent identifier. Here the rule is, if the query is a new query, so not one that has been issued before, it's a unique new query, then we assign a new persistent identifier. If the same query has been issued before and the result set is exactly the same as in an earlier execution, so none of the underlying data has changed, then we return the existing persistent identifier. If the query is an existing query that has been issued before, but the result set differs because data has changed since the last time it was executed, then we would assign a new persistent identifier because it identifies a new and different subset of the data. Note that, however, that we can identify the earlier, basically, version of the same query, and one could want to provide a link to earlier semantically identical subsets, although the data has changed in between, as part on, uh, of the metadata on the landing page. So that's the assignment of a persistent identifier, and you can assign any persistent identifier system that you favor within your data center. Recommendation nine says then, well, store the query, store the metadata, the persistent identifier, the original query, and the normalized query if you have rewritten the string. Um, the query um, checksum hash key, the result set checksum or hash key, the timestamp, if you want also the persistent identifier of the superset, so the database that the query went to, data set description, and any other um, information that you might consider relevant in your settings, such as whatever, a user ID or the IP address where the query was issued from. That really depends then on uh, your individual setting. And recommendation 10 is really to encourage users to also make use of the possibility of citing data now, which says you know, provide, in addition to providing the user with a persistent identifier, to, in addition to providing them with the actual data, also provide them with a citation text snippet in BibTeX, EndNote, freeform text, so that they can cut and paste and copy it to um, any report, paper, and so on. Note that for identifying the subset of data, if you want to use it in a machine processable way, the persistent identifier should be enough. So you can basically use the persistent identifier as an input parameter to a processing, to a workflow, to a process, um, because the persistent identifier should resolve to a landing page, as we will see on the next slide, and that should be machine actionable to allow it to be used directly in, in machine processable automated ways. Recommendations 11 and 12 are exactly those two issues. So once a persistent identifier is issued, people use it either as a parameter or as a citation in a report, in a paper. Resolving that persistent identifier should lead to a landing page, as it is standard practice in persistent identification of digital content. 
Um, that should be, of course, human readable, provide the metadata, link to the superset, and so on. But it should also be machine actionable. So some form of API that a machine can parse to allow automated query processing rather than just manual um, interpretation and manual bound links. This is because we want to support um, automated analysis pipelines, uh, meta studies, automatic re-execution of, of studies and so on and so forth. And I, we think this um, machine actionability is one of the key issues that should be addressed. Um, given that, oh, taking that permissions are granted to access the data. Now recommendations 13 and 14 are um, only really important in the long term perspective. Data will never remain identical and frozen forever. So the underlying database engines, the storage technology and so on will change. Now, such a migration of data is a major effort for any data center. So hardly any data center embarks on that lightly, changing the technology every two weeks or months. However, when the an, a research infrastructure decides to change its data model, its data schema, move to a new technology, they undergo the process of migrating all the data. And at the same time, while migrating the data, one would also migrate the query strings that have been stored so that they can be processed by the new data infrastructure. So you either adapt them to the new schema, to the new APIs um, that are supported by the data center from that time onwards. And of course, once you do that migration, it makes sense to re-execute a few of the queries and verify that both data migration and the query migration worked successfully, that we can still re-execute the old queries on the new data infrastructure. Yeah. So just to sum up the recommendations, what we can do now is we can identify any arbitrary subset, even the empty set, so a query does not return any results, and provide a persistent identifier for that by having, while still having very low storage overhead. We basically only have to store the query string plus the hash keys and timestamps. We can get, with that citation, with that identifier, we can get the subset as it was cited or as it is now, so benefiting from all updates. The query provides excellent, very detailed, very specific technical provenance information. Whether you show that to the user or not is then a design decision, but at least it's available. And available fully for free because it's generated automatically. And the query store supports analysis of data usage. So you can actually find out which parts of the data were used, how often, and so on. And we've got checksums as fixed information that allow us to verify whether that data set really was correctly downloaded and the query correctly re-executed again. The nice thing about that is that this applies no matter whether you've got small data or large data. It doesn't really matter whether you have static and dynamic data because the only difference is that with static data, there won't be any new versions. And it works across all kinds of data representations, so relational database models, um, comma super value files, XML, linked data. Although the ways how you do the timestamping and versioning, of course, will differ. <coughs> Something we also notice is that it would also work for more sophisticated transformations. So you could actually apply any generic processing beyond simply selecting or projecting subsets of the data. However, we currently kept the recommendations really to standard selection and projection, so really subset identification aspects of data, because the more complex those operations get that you allow to be performed as part of the query, uh, the more complex it might be to ensure that those uh, keep the identical semantics over time. So if you do very sophisticated analytical processing already as part of the query, transformation and so on, you need to ensure that those transformations then perform exactly the same as you change technology. So here is basically the, the caveat on where we want to err on the, the safer side for the time being. 
reading the, the, the questions that came, came in. Um, is there a suggested citation recommendation related to having a DOI for a parent data set by the local persistent identifier for the query that responds to the specific subset? Um, there is no explicit recommendation on whether you assign a DOI only to the parent set or whether you want to have a DOI or any other identifier also for the, the subset. But it is definitely sort of the option that you describe here in, in, the, the, in the question box, in the chat box, is definitely a viable solution where you say we have um, DOIs for the parent data set and another form of persistent identifier for the subset. That really is a design decision that might have an impact on how you trace citations. So if the researcher wants to have a, a DOI or an, an ARC or whatever, for their very subset, because that eases later, you know, um, credit giving and counting of who was reusing a certain set, then it might be beneficial to have DOIs or ARCs or whatever for both. Or you can combine them in the way that you identified it here in, in your query. Does this answer the question for the time being? Good, well, I'm waiting, okay, perfect. So what I'd like to do now um, in the remaining 15 minutes is to run very quickly through some of the pilots um, and some of the adoption things that we've done. And as I was obviously not involved in all of those, I can't really do credit to the very individual technical details of all of those pilots. But I just want to show you, um, basically give you an overview of which data centers are working it. There is contact information for all of those. And basically, you might be interested in then either contacting those people directly um, or at least learning from the kind of data we have. So what we did at the very beginning of the working group, and those are the first two pilots that are listed here as finished, was very early pilots where we tested conceptually the idea in dedicated projects. These were not rolled out to operational research infrastructures, but what we did is we took a copy of operational databases, implemented the recommendations, and tested whether they would work, whether you know, that would scale, how, whether it could be implemented, and so on. And the longer now um, the working group was running, the more new pilots were being started that are now actually being implemented in operational databases. Um, VMDC is one of those that are actually being already deployed in a running infrastructure, and I'll show you some examples of that. And the other pilots have just been starting now with funding having been acquired. So what we have done in many of the cases is first run conceptually through the tasks of the various data centers, see how it could be implemented, and then people were requesting funding to actually start de developing and deploying them. I'll just run at different speeds through some of the pilots to give you an overview what we're doing. The first pilot uh, was implemented by Stefan Pröll uh, for SQL style data. And it was implemented within the context of two projects. One was a laboratory of civil engineering in Portugal, um, an infrastructure where they automatically monitor dams and bridges for stability, so lots of sensors in the concrete measuring um, vibrations, measuring um, deformations, stress and tension, and so on some of the manual measuring temperature, some of them automatically, and they are fed into a central database. The database automatically runs analysis processes uh, on the stability of the construct, and that produces then uh, PDF reports that go to specific sites um, for reporting. And another pilot in that context was from a completely different domain, information retrieval domain, where a benchmark data set um, on music files that is being used by different people to compare different algorithms um, has been collected. The data has undergone several versions of error correction. Um, features are being extracted. Ground truth assignments have changed. So again, um, a SQL database where this, uh, this data evolves and is being used for different kinds of studies. And what we did in the first study is we tried to find out different ways of um, timestamping and versioning the databases. So there is, and all of that is standard technology that has been around for decades, so no rocket science here. But basically, just three core ways how one could do that. One could integrate the timestamping and versioning uh, 
in the live table. Um, that means changing, adding a few columns to the table where the timestamps uh, go, where the deletion dates go, and so on. Um, and that obviously changes the API of all interfaces that access the database. Another approach would be to keep the history table completely separate, so to duplicate the database, um, have the live database unchanged, so no changes to the APIs, and all the versioning happening in a copy of the database. And that's where the historic queries would go. And then obviously there's a hybrid version where you keep the live system unchanged and you only move the deleted and updated so the no longer valid records into a history table. And then the queries for historic data would span both tables, the live database and the history table. And so the, the difference really is, you know, how, what is the effect on the storage demand? What is the effect on query complexity? And, you know, how much do we need to adapt different APIs of existing software? And so that Stefan implemented that, tested it, added a query store where we stored the metadata, the hash key of the query results, and so on and so forth. And that worked out pretty fine. There is a report on that that is published. It's also linked from the uh, web page if you're, you're interested. There's a few examples of how one would then rewrite the query to make sure that you also select the, the data items depending on the timestamp that was issued from depending on the query execution timestamp and then removing those data items that have been marked as deleted before that query execution timestamp and so on and so forth. So nothing um, terribly exciting, robust standard technology on that part. Um, Stefan also did a pilot for comma separated value files and that was actually a pretty interesting thing that came out from one of the working group meetings. Because when we initially decided to do this, uh, we were focused on really highly dynamic, highly large scale data volumes and so on. But we found out that lots of people had comma separated value file data that was also dynamic where new data items were being added and so on. So we wanted to check whether there is ways how one could support that even for those smaller scale but still dynamic data sets. And basically the two, two options, two solutions that are currently being implemented for that um, is on the one hand either a migration to a relational database transparently in the background. So users upload commercial value files and in the background they are migrated to SQL tables, MySQL tables and that the user then can select the subsets and get back comma separate value files again. Or we have a second solution that is currently being finalized that relies on, on versioning systems such as Subversion or in our case a Git repository in the background for simply storing the files, new versions of the files, and also the queries which are then Java based via Java interface selecting rows and columns of the uh, CSV files are also being stored in a separate branch of the same Git repository. And just to give you an idea, I mean, again, there is nothing exciting happening here. Basically, the files are being uploaded either to the Git repository or to the um, SQL database via web interface. You can append new data, you can delete existing records, and the Git system or the database keep them track of the, the versions, and they also store the query. And here's just, I guess, a screenshot now, yeah, from where you basically upload um, a new file and you can either create a new database version or it automatically, or you upload it into an existing database, identify what the primary key is. That's important for identifying which records have been added and deleted. And then the file basically gets uploaded in the database and then you can see it via web interface in the background you've got the rows and columns, you can filter subsets and then of course download them and get a PID assigned for the, for the query. But for the user it's transparently, for the user it's, it's always going to be a CSV file basically. Um, yeah, this is basically the download screenshot here. For the next example, VMDC, Virtual Atomic and Molecular Dataset, that's a pilot that is run by Calamaria 12. And this was actually a very exciting pilot because this pilot was not working on a single database, but really on a distributed federated database system. So 28 
individual databases that are run more or less independently from each other that have a central infrastructure for an XML schema for exchanging queries and result sets between them. And this was one of the, the early parts that the first one that was really started to implement the whole rec set of recommendations um, in a live system. And the way they do it basically is um, the user poses a query using either a central portal or they can post queries directly to the independent data sets. The VMDC client then dispatches and distributes the query to individual databases, gets the result set back as XML files, merges those, and returns to the user a single set of records in, in, a single exam, in, in those XAMS files. And what they have already done so far is they have updated the, the schema of the XML files to support um, this timestamping of the queries and the return of persistent identifiers. And they are now currently implementing, they have implemented the query store and now implementing the web services that would then allow you to get a persistent identifier, um, send it with, uh, to the web service, the web service would then return the timestamp, this would be sent to another web service that would then send the query to the uh, respective databases, and they would then rerun those individually and return the associated data. And mind that the timestamps are not synchronized across all those databases because they would be horrendously expensive, but each database individually keeps its local timestamps. And they, they have they have impl uh, started implementing that, um, and there is a paper that should be out pretty soon, we hope, uh, that provides a bit more background information of how the whole infrastructure is currently evolving. Yeah, so the design of the query store is almost finished, and they have now also gotten funding from RDE Europe to continue implementation of the, the various web services and to start discussing with editors how that could be then integrated with um, the citation in the journal repositories, which I think would be then a big step forward of actually making this useful externally. Um, a completely different pilot is now being started at the Uni Washington University in St. Louis in the medical domain. In this case, um, there is uh, the Center for Bioinformatics and Informatics has a health record management system that's called I2B2. That's an open source solution that's in pretty widespread use all across the world. I was surprised to hear that even we in Austria um, are using I2B2 in, in some venues for managing patient records. And they have a pretty huge database of about two billion records on all kind of you know, patients, encounters, medications, lab results, and so on and so forth. And they've now obtained uh, some funding from our RDA US to implement a solution in the next nine months. So this is just about starting. So we've, they've gone through the first conceptual design, um, trying to implement the recommendations. Uh, discussing different ways of doing the time summit versioning. I2B2 already does support storing queries, so there needs to be a little bit of extension to the system to assign times to have the times of the query also being used for re-execution and assigning a persistent identifier to it and potentially adding this fixity information and so on. So this is kind of a, a rough design of how that's gonna be put into practice in the actual system. Basically, uh, the idea would be to implement the, the recommendations in an instance of I2B2, and as soon as that is finished and tested, that would be contributed back to the open source uh, main branch in, in GitHub of I2B2, and if that is then being accepted, that would allow all data centers that are using I2B2 for managing uh, patient records, medical records, to actually benefit from that implementation, which would be a huge boost um, both to the community as well as to us as a seeing that this whole thing actually makes sense and can get adopted. <laughs> 
Um, another pilot that's worked on in, as part of the Envy Plus project, where Ari Asmi is involved, um, there is a, a larger set of, uh, a, a huge set of data centers that collaborate within Envy Plus. And one of the infrastructures that will be implementing this data citation is ICAS, Carbon Observatory System, collecting data, some of that in near real time in, in their databases. The databases are distributed. There is a central web interface and versioning the database is okay in that set. So that's already been tested and partially implemented. Um, one issue is that users can not only access the entire database via the single web interface, but some users also have direct APIs that go through individual databases, distributed ones. And basically what one would need to do is if you wanted to enable that or enforce that kind of citation or identification mechanism across all of them, then you would need to change all those APIs individually. So one solution would potentially be to first only support the main web interface um, subsetting and then later on see where the other ones are, could be be added and how they could be supported, avoiding users bypassing the system. Um, another pilot that came from discussion with the Marine Group in, um, in RDA, Marine Data Harmonization Group, is the Argo use case. The Argo Boy Network, it's basically a network of boys that are distributed all across the oceans, um, diving and popping up and sending data via satellite uplink to a central database. Um, and again, that data becomes available immediately for studies and is then later on sensors are recalibrated and data quality is improved via, via update once the recalibration parameters are known. And what will happen in this use case is, apart from supporting the citation, is to also discuss with uh, data sites specifically how the metadata schema could be or should be adopted in order to support the subset identification um, as part of the citation metadata. And again, the idea would be to test the viability um, across different uh, data centers, several data centers hosting those Argo Boy network data and to feedback that information both into the marine community via ODIP, um, EUDOT and Envry Plus where they're also a member. Um, Picodemo and R2R, two data sets that are using largely CSV files. Um, some of that um, dynamic, others are frozen once the data has been collected. Again, a use case that comes from the Marine Data Harmonization Interest Group. And again, if you have more detailed questions on the actual data, it's probably wise to contact the use case owners directly because they have much deeper insights than, than I do. Basically, what we've done in discussions is run through the data representations, see how that the timestamp and versioning could be done. And it turns out that specifically for Picodemo, recommendations 1 to 11, and the old numbering that we had in those days uh, worked well. Uh, recommendation 12, this technology migration would obviously require more more efforts once um, once such such changes should happen. Um, R2R is a bit easier because there is no evolving data, so the dynamics, it, it's basically static data sets, so the, the versioning issue would not be needed to be implemented in that case. Again, here is an example from this, um, sub, this data as common separate value files as, as it's being collected in those use cases. Slide, please update. Yeah. So again, what, what will be implemented in those um, use cases, in those pilot series, that subsets are identified, the DOI gets requested and assigned to that subset via the query, and the metadata is stored, and it will create a new landing page for the subset UI that then would point 
to also to the, the superset that it came from. So that's kind of the, the plan within this pilot. So I just wanted to give you an impression
thanks a lot, Andy. Um, oh, I'm afraid we have an echo again. Um, yeah, um, I mute. My mic to you, my mic to answer Sebastian's question. Yes. Uh, if I understood correctly, you said that only the final version of the query should be stored permanently. How would that be implemented practically? Um, I guess you're referring to the statement uh, that I made on one of the pilots where uh, the system was storing all the queries, but it would not immediately assign it, um, a DOI or some other persistent identifiers to all the queries. They were stored um, in some staging area, basically, because in that case, um, lots of users were posing queries, trying to identify data sets, reissuing queries again and again. And basically only sometimes even two or three days later, when they had a chance to look at the data that the query identified, said, that's the one that's gonna go into my study. And then you would go basically to work and say, that's the query that I want to get a DOI for. And then all the other queries would automatically be purged from, um, the query store, so to speak. So it's it's not that each query that gets posed to a data center would immediately need a DUI. You can also basically prepare it, keeping it in a staging area, and only store those and only assign DUIs to those queries that are then actually being used or that where researchers want to have a person identifier. In some other settings, of course, you don't need to do that. You assign an identifier to each query that gets issued. It's really an implementation setting. Does this answer the question? So, any, do you have any other questions? While you're typing, I've got a question. So, I was wondering if the lessons learned from the pilots are published somewhere. We haven't written up extensively on the on the current pilots. We have published two or three papers on the very first pilots that we discussed uh, within the working group. So the LNIC use case is published, the um, MSD use case is published. For all the other ones, they are, as I said in the, the overview table, they are just starting the implementation. So we hope we will be able to write up a summary paper on, on lessons learned once more of these become available in real deployed versions. But the other ones, yes, they have been published and should be linked all from the working group website. And the, the IEEE paper is also linked from within these slides. Thank you, Andy. And it's impressive how much work your working group has done. Um, I was also wondering for how long this set of recommendations has been stable. Do you think there might come some new recommendations or is it kind of so complete that, that it's unprobable and there will be anything new? <laughs> That's a good question. It's very hard to predict the future. Um, the yeah. only thing I can yeah. say is that we, we had a, so from the first iteration of the recommendations until now, we did have changes, but they only affected the wording. So there was no substantial change to the substance. You will notice if you follow the earlier versions of the recommendations that the numbering has changed. We had a few debates of, you know, should we keep timestamping and versioning as separate recommendations or don't they usually go together, which technically they do. Then we decided let's keep them semantically separate because they are serving two different purposes. So, yes, I think we might change the wording in order to clarify things. Uh, we had issues with hash keys, fixity information, terms that are not equally understood by the various communities. Mm -hmm. We might come up with more recommendations on the kind of operations that may be performed. So select project as we describe it currently a very generic work across all data types, basically. Um, some people wanted to do more advanced processing, allow more advanced processing the queries, where we still haven't got a good feeling whether these could be equally supported across all different types of um, data representations. So I guess, yes, there will be lessons learned, but I do not expect for the time being drastic changes to the recommendations. Mm 
That's good to know. That's good to know. Okay, there was a question. How do you let us know if you start a citation pilot? Um, how to message the working group? So the working group has an, an email address, has a mailing list, and I hope I've got the link here on the last slide. I'm not sure. Let's see what I can flip back. So there is the, this is the link to the mailing list, and if you're subscribed to the working group, then you can post to this mailing list. Um, or you can contact any of the chairs directly, so our email addresses should be up there as well via the RDA website. And especially if you want to run or organize a workshop, or if you have any specific questions, um, we'll try to help as, as much as we can. So we will have, also for some of the other pilots, we did run or will run dedicated workshops with individual users. I mean, I, I don't expect now a flood of 100 workshops or people approaching me for 100 workshops, but what we want to do is then to specifically discuss any, any issues and questions on concrete examples, because that's usually more useful than doing it in a very generic way. So short answer, drop us an email, um, send out an announcement via the mailing list. We will also put up um, a part on the, on the wiki for, the, for our working group where users can then add their own pilots. And we hope that that will work fine. If you've got any other suggestions for how we could enable those kind of you know, knowledge exchange and sharing, please let us know as well. Contacting us. Thanks a lot, Andy. Do you have any more questions? No, no, I don't think so. So thanks a lot to all for attending. And thanks very much, Andreas, for your very interesting talk. And I would like to announce our next webinar, which will take place on Wednesday in two weeks. Hilary Hennehoe and Francoise Chenova will tell us about um, the Tokyo plenary.